Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a real honour to be here this morning and I left, uh, I, I left Durham at six o'clock and spent a lot of time on a public service called the railways this morning. And I want you to think about the type of experience that I've had as somebody trying to get here to this conference. All sorts of things could have really tripped me up, but I made it with ten minutes. And I've had the privilege of following David. I've always followed David in my career and it'll, it'll never change. But he did teach me one or two things while you think about the service that I've had as a customer from our national railways. So two or three things I learned from David's presentation. First of all, I also have a bad carbon footprint. My, my teenage children taught me that. I, I've been doing this job for about uh, six months. And uh, one of the things that they observed in, in, from their schooling was that I had a bad carbon footprint. I wouldn't have made that same observation 30 years ago when I was their age. I've also learnt, when I looked in the garage at the weekend, judging by the number of dishwasher tablets that we own, that actually they are addictive. <laughs> actually, I, I presume that my better half, Mrs Wilkinson, bought two for one. So the savvy shopper is definitely working in the Wilkinson household. Did anybody go to the uh, farming conference that was here on Friday? Because I was down here on Friday... Uh, really stretching my carbon footprint. Anybody at the Sainsbury's Farming Conference? Good. Not because you shouldn't have been there. It's just that I did hear that when you speak to a group, uh, an audience, um, somebody said to me uh, uh, on Friday, it's the ABC XYZ. Always be concise and examine your zipper. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, what David talked about just now is something that as a farmer's son in the bank, uh, working for an organisation that our chairman has poo-pooed slightly, um, I would have to tell you the first presentation is well meant. You've heard nothing yet about lamb production and beef production, but what David has tried to do, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time taking a bit further forward, is actually absolutely obsessing about your customer. Because I think that agriculture needs to know its customer a little bit more than perhaps it does at the moment. So I'm going to be very challenging. I'm going to talk about the opportunities and I'm going to try and help you understand how you can turn what David and I talk about into a genuine practical opportunity. I've been in the bank nearly 25 years and I can tell you here and now, I don't know a bigger opportunity than that's in front of you people now. The opportunity to seize it is, is down to you. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about are how you look at yourselves in the mirror and how you run your business. Because when I look at agriculture right across the board, and I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the things that I see in agriculture now, I'll be honest, ladies and gentlemen, I see very, very mixed results. So I want you to use this morning and, and the whole day as a platform to make sure that your business is absolutely the best in class. You've got to work out what that looks like yourself. Uh, you won't hear a blueprint from me. You'll hear, you'll hear some of the things that go really well for business. But when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the difference between the best and the worst business is actually the manager running it, please start and think about how you're going to leave here and run your business when you get back home. Because at the end of the day, especially as David has said, a lot of what we're going to talk about is how you move a commodity. However special you make it, however, however you run it, however you develop it, you are actually selling a commodity. And therefore, for you to achieve best in class, you've literally got to be the best business manager uh, of all. And as David has pointed out, there is a, you know, a very, very big opportunity in the world, but obviously it's incredibly challenging. So, ladies and gentlemen, I start with this first graph, and I make no bones about it. Many of you that have heard me speak before will, will hear me talk about this. And this just looks at the figures that come out of DEFRA on an annual basis. They are in real terms, so the 2011 figures are uh, as accurate as I can make them. Um, they are, uh, if you like, adjusted from time to time uh, through the year as, as figures come in. But they prove that farming in the last few years has actually been uh, reasonably good compared with the, uh, sort of 10 years ago. 
Uh, and they, they are improving, and we, we can talk about the weather and other things that are going to impact now. But, but obviously, in real terms, not quite as good as the mid-90s. You will look at the green line and you will realise that farm incomes are, for the last three or four years, above the amount of support that agriculture receives. Ladies and gentlemen, as an industry, uh, with no sort of reflection on, on anybody present in this room, if you look at that as an industry return uh, without subsidy, actually it's a pretty shocking result. And it, I'm starting to believe that agriculture does actually underperform in terms of what it can achieve and how well it can perform. And I'm going to try and show you some of that difference a little later. But at least the amount of income that, that farming can uh, generate is actually above and beyond uh, subsidy. The red line uh, shows the relationship between the pound and the euro. Uh, clearly, for obvious reasons, the pound and the euro uh, have a big impact on farm incomes. But you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that in the last two or three years, there's been significant deviation. And in DEFRA's own words, that deviation is due to two things. One, the uh, actual rising cost of inputs, uh, especially soya, uh, agrochemicals, fuel, machinery and spare parts. They're all dollar-driven costs. And the amount of, of uh, investment that agriculture has placed on, on farm machinery. And, and even in a very testing year as, as 2012 has been, there's no doubt about it that uh, you know, one has to question how, how investment in machinery has worked. Uh, I think it's been a difficult harvest. Uh, I'm moving slightly away from, from livestock just when I make this next comment. But uh, you know, during that very testing harvest, there, will, there were still surplus uh, sort of combines and tractors and trailers to sell, uh, as I saw in the farming press. So we, so we weren't running ourselves as efficiently as we could do. And I think, I think one of the things that you've got to do as an audience uh, in terms of striving for that uh, top slot is work out how you run your business and what costs you incur in your business in order to deliver that. David talked uh, about um, the food chain, and I, I, I've stolen this graph uh, and, and this chart from the Oxford Farming Conference uh, earlier this year, and it just suggests uh, where the power base might be in terms of, of the, 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 the if, if you like, the pressure points in, um, in agriculture. I put this up because uh, three or four weeks ago, I, I actually attended a, a conference um, in London where they suggested that the power base was starting to change and it was moving more to consumers, which you've heard about this morning, and more to farmers. Now, I'm talking about a very gradual process. The reason why I say that is that your customer is beginning to become quite anxious about security of supply, and I can quote many cases like that. Uh, and we had the question earlier on where, you know, the rate of population growth was, was, was falling, so really, was that a problem? Uh, yes, it's a problem because one billion people go to bed hungry every night, as they did in 1973. One billion people go to bed without clean water. And, ladies and gentlemen, there's no more land. There's no more water. Even nutrients are starting to become limiting. So this is going to flex and change, and you need to think about how you operate in that, in that very testing and challenging marketplace that David's talked about. He also talked about the price spikes that we've seen very recently. And when I talk to farmers and growers about the opportunity that this gives, there's no doubt about it, it does give huge opportunity as long as the spikes are upwards. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. And one of the things that, that you're going to have to think about uh, as compared to your fathers or, or, or the other business people that you're working with is how you deal with the whole subject of volatility. Volatility, I totally agree with David, is here to stay. Volatility is going to become more extreme, and with that becomes a, a far greater upside and a far greater downside. So how are you going to run your business to cope with that? And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on. One of the things that uh, David has talked about, uh, and we're certainly seeing it um, around the world, and, and of course, uh, you know, food prices and, and, uh, and, if you like, farming economics in this country is not just down to what happens here, it's a global industry. We are seeing an increasing demand for grain and soya, which has been driven by that demand that David has, has talked about in terms of uh, soya and grain for poultry and pig meat. 
and in certain cases, uh, beef as well. But one of the things we must think about as a farming industry, and, and David did describe an incredibly successful food chain. I don't get the chance to travel as much as he, did, as he does globally. But, but the UK um, food industry is seen a bit like the Beckhams or the Royals, an amazing success story for the UK. Uh, and it is, you know, really, really the envy of the world. The re real challenge for agriculture is that if you take out inflation, the actual return to agriculture has been flat for about 20 years. And what we need to think about is how we start and change that. Because I said right at the beginning of my presentation, the most important thing in your business is your customer. That's the one thing the bank tell me, as I said, every, 20, every day of my 25 years. And however you set off to look after the customer, bearing in mind we don't always get it right, every commercial business has to think about its customer first. And I won't ask for a share of hands, but I will ask you to think about who is your customer, how well do you know them, and how well should you know them. And if you think your customer is the market, that might well be true. But what happens after that point? What happens after the livestock market? And are you providing something that is tailored for your ultimate, for your ultimate customer? Or is it just a means of selling it rather than marketing it? And, and if you don't know the difference in those two words, I ask you to uh, really look at that uh, a little later on.